Jesus heals this man that's in the tombs, this demon possessed. And then they, they get back in the boat and they go back across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum, which was the town, the main, the main town where Jesus lived. And that's where Peter, Andrew, James, and John lived as well. But when they get there, there's all these crowds waiting for them, all these people that come there. And from that, uh, I want to read Mark 5, 25 to 34. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that a power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, We see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, uh, there's some meaning here that we, not being Jewish, we, we may not pick up immediately. She had an issue of blood, a hemorrhage for 12 years. According to the law, any issue of blood made you unclean because you see blood was a sign of death that if you were issuing blood it means it would mean death god was life so to be holy to approach god you could not be close to death touch anyone who had been dead and these things just sound so strange to us or have any blood coming from you and so that had been her case for 12 years now now catch this 12 years she's been unclean means 12 years she can't go to synagogue, 12 years she can't go to temple. It means she's probably not married. It means she's an outcast of her society. Nobody wants to come around her because if they touch her, then they are unclean. And when we just don't grasp what this would mean, kind of similar to Ebola today. You know, everybody's like, get back. And that's the way this lady would have been, but she would have been completely cut off from the religious leaders and teachers and everyone of that day and probably from her own family and everyone else. That's her condition. Isolation. Hopeless. And she just wants to touch the hem of his garment. Now, Luke and, and um, Matthew both carry this story and Luke uh, tells us that what she wants to touch is the fringe or these tassels that hang on the male garments the the robes would have four tassels as were prescribed by law and they were these you know the the pharisees wanted to look really really religious so they had great big tassels all right but everybody else had these just little tassels prescribed by law which was to remind them of the law and to kind of symbolize god's presence with them so she says if i can just touch his tassel, I will get well. She's tried all the doctors, she's tried all the cures, and we're not sure what she knows about Jesus. All it says is after hearing about Jesus. But we're not sure what she knows about him. So her, her faith is definitely small. Just really small starter kind of faith. All right, that Jesus might be someone who could heal her, and the touch point is his tassels. If she could touch the tassels of his cloak, then she says that she thinks that she will be well, and Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Just, I mean, this is, this is beginner's faith is what this is, just as simple as it can be. Now, faith is the subject in the New Testament. It's the dominant subject in the New Testament, 
the word faith and believe mean essentially the same thing. John uses the word believe instead of faith in his gospel. The other three gospels use the word faith, but, but John is predominantly using the word believe. They both come from the same word group in Greek, so they both mean the same thing. But over 400 times this is mentioned in the New Testament. And just to give you a real simple definition of faith, faith is trust and dependence on God. That's what it means to believe in God, to, to have faith in, in God is trust and dependence on him. And th this has a, a number of different areas that touch us. So the, the first one we think about is salvation. We come to salvation, we gain salvation uh, through faith. Um, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, Acts 16.31. Or uh, as Paul says in Ephesians 2.8, uh, by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. So it's God's grace that saves us, but we, uh, we receive it through faith, through trust and dependence upon Jesus. Jesus said, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. See, this, these are all salvation scriptures, John 3, 36. So, you know, we, we know that we don't earn salvation and we don't get salvation because we've been such good people, but it's the gift that we receive and the way that we receive it is by trusting in God. And it's also a matter of prayer. There's so many prayer promises that we run into that mention faith. Faith is the condition for prayer. Uh, Jesus in, in Mark 11, 24 says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. If we have faith that we're receiving it, he says, that it's going to be ours. Or, or again, he said, if you've got a faith like a mustard seed, uh, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. That's what he told his disciples. So the mustard seed, I remember... Um, years ago, uh, more years than what we want to talk about, uh, women would often wear this little piece of glass with a mustard seed on the inside as a necklace. And it was just a tiny little thing. And to, to a non-Christian, it meant nothing. It looked like a strange little thing to wear around your neck. And yet to a Christian, you would recognize it as a mustard seed. And that was her uh, reminder that just to have a little bit of faith, the faith of a mustard seed. Without faith, without believing, without trusting, depending on God, we, we stand on our own. I mean, uh, faith all, also means connection. Uh, Hebrews 11.6, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. So as we start talking about faith, and this, the subject's just so huge. We, we can't talk about everything, but, but essentially it has to do with our salvation, it has to do with our prayer effectiveness, it has to do with our ability to connect with God. So how's your faith today? As you sit here this morning, well, what's the condition of your faith? You know, is it strong? Is it weak? Is it growing? Is it developing? Last week we we looked at fear and the, the incompatibility of fear and faith. And remember, we can't be afraid and have faith at the same time. The two don't mix. Uh, but it's rather just a, a simple thing to understand that increasing my faith is what I want. But, but we all have these habits and patterns of having anxiety and fear about usually the same things. And they're deep-seated. It's rough to break. And we know how to be afraid, like we said last week, but we're not sure, perhaps, how to develop my trust and my dependence on God. And that's why I chose this story of the woman who had the issue of blood, of this woman who was cut off because she just had just this little bit of faith. It wasn't great faith at all. But even in that state of hopelessness, she had enough faith to receive from Jesus that day everything that she needed, just a little bit. And as we explore the nature of faith, we find that the subject is just, I mean, it's just so huge. It's like talking about trying to understand air or water. I mean, it's just so vast, the, the subject of faith. But, but to, to understand it's helpful to look at what faith perhaps isn't sometimes. And, 
And so I want to just go through a few knockoffs because there's some misconceptions about faith in our culture. And the first one that I think of, think of is a lot of times when we talk about faith, we think of really faith in self. And this is going to hit us all, what I'm going to say. So just kind of need to own this a little bit and, and don't get mad at Don, okay? For many, faith is about self-confidence. And self-confidence is a, a good thing, you know, self-confidence to, to believe in yourself, to know your own gifts and your abilities is a good thing. It's not bad, but it's not the faith that's found in the Bible. I mean, the lady with the, the, the hemorrhage was not healed because she was so confident. That's not why God rewarded her, as he said, well, you're, you're a very optimistic person. Uh, you will get healed. Quite the opposite. She had no confidence. Once she had touched his garment, she was scared to death. Because, you see, she was afraid that this leader, this, this Jewish leader who was what Jesus was at the time, the, Jew, the Jewish leader would turn on her. For she was unclean and she touched him and she just made him unclean. And so she, she actually came with some fear there and, and you know, not, not understanding exactly who Jesus was and what he was going to do. But we have this whole idea of optimism and belief in ourself. And, you know, let's not confuse faith in God with self-confidence. Uh, you see these posters all the time about, you know, trying to get your confidence up. And, I mean, how many of you have had the poster with the little kitty that's hanging on? I mean, that's, you know, hang in there. You've all had that right? No? Okay, I'm embarrassed now. Uh, to, don't go in my basement. You know, I got all those posters all over. The, you can do it, Don. You're great. You know, that kind of stuff. But all, all that kind of, you know, self-confidence stuff. But self-confidence has nothing to do with faith, with trusting and depending on God. Remember, I'm going to show my age again, but I think some of you were there. Remember Stuart Smalley on Saturday Night Live? No, you don't remember Stuart Smalley on Saturday Night Live? Is actually uh, Al Franken, who's the senator now, was an actor, right? Did I get that name right? Uh, okay, I'm close. You know who I mean. But he had this had this skit that he'd do on Saturday Night Live, and he'd look into the mirror to try to encourage himself, and he'd say, "I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and daggone it, people like me." You know, and he was making fun of that whole self-help uh, stuff, but. You know, that's, that's what many people think that faith is, is being confident and talking themselves into something that I can go out there and do it and it's going to be a great day. And, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that that's a terrible thing, but it's just not faith in God. It, those are two different things. The person we are trusting in, you see, there is ourselves, that, that, that we can do it, that we have the power to deliver to ourselves what we need. And we're trusting and depending on ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I'd like somebody who's much more powerful than me. I want to trust in someone much more powerful than me. If, in fact, you know, in America, uh, we're finding right now that we're kind of in the, this whole um, scenario about self-confidence has gotten to extreme proportions. Uh, David Brooks, who writes the New York Times, calls it the magnific magnification of the self. And uh, he, he gives some statistics there in one of his articles. He said 70% of high school students claim that they have above average leadership skills. Only 2% are below average. So 70% are above average. You know that can't be right, right? But only 2% are below average. So he's got 2% of the followers. Everybody else is, is leader. And he observes that just a few decades ago that it would have been unthinkable for a baseball player to hit a home run and then to celebrate himself while he stands there at home plate. I mean, nobody would have done that 20 or 30 years ago. He says the number of high school seniors who believe that they were, quote, a very important person in the 1950s, 12 percent, in the 1990s, 80 percent. High school seniors who think that we're a very important person, 80% of us. And according to Brooks, American men are especially susceptible to this. And what he looks at is that if you're a man, you're twice as likely to die trying to save someone else who is drowning than a woman. Because men think that they can swim. And men usually believe that they're great swimmers when they're drunk. For some reason, drinking beer, they think makes you great swimmer. And so 
today, someplace in America, there will be a boating accident and some guy who's really soused will jump in the water trying to save someone else because he thinks, that he believes in himself that he can do it. If faith is, in self is so powerful, then why is our confidence not producing higher test scores? If our students in school are who they think they are, then why aren't our scores just rising? But they're not. The second one, the knockoff I want to talk about is faith in humanity. I mean, some people have almost a blind faith in humanity and appears to be noble and, and positive and able to give you confidence and encouragement for a while. I mean, my hope in the future rests in the goodness of of humanity and the goodness in people. And you know, not a day goes by, but while we don't see somebody that, that does some great things for us, and we're impressed. I mean, somebody lets us in line, or you see in the news, an anonymous guy gives his kidney to somebody, and we go, wow, you know, people are still good, and it encourages us. But if all of our trust and faith were in the overall goodness of humanity, then why is the world not getting any better? You'd think that we would be making some improvements here. And the reality is, is that we think we're doing okay for a while. And then, you know, some terrible things happen. You go, wow, I'm, I'm not sure humanity is quite as elevated as what I thought it was. Like when they take a six inch knife and cut off the head of a journalist. And you go, he's a person too. If I believe in the goodness of humanity, what about him? What about them? See? Then the third one that I thought of, and I just put a question mark down here. This is faith in, and you put this in the, in the blank. There's a, another knockoff of faith. It's belief in things like Lucky Charms, you know. And, um, not the cereal, but, but actually, you know, like uh, Lucky Amulets and, and uh, you know, rabbit's foots and uh, falling stars or, you know, throwing coins in the fountain and birthday candles. Remember as a kid when they told you about wishing? Man, I remember that. And it's like, okay, if you blow out all five of your birthday candles, you can make a wish, but you can't tell anybody else what the wish was or it won't come true. And it's like, I've stumbled on this great system of control in the world where I can have anything that I want if I just wish hard enough, you know? Kids do this. Some of us never lose that. You know, we go through life thinking that it's all about fate and luck and you know, so we play the Powerball. I mean, <laughs> excuse me, uh, it's about the same thing. Putting your money on a Powerball is believing that there's some kind of anonymous force someplace that your number is going to come up. Of course, you're playing your lucky numbers. And some people get this mixed up and they think that that is doing something in faith because you're thinking that something good is going to happen in the future. But that's not faith. You see, it's not faith at all. It's belief in a question mark out there is what that is. Trust in that. And then the last one is faith and faith. This one hits the church. And uh, this is a knockoff of real faith in God where uh, we find this, this mostly in the church. People think and they get things twisted from being a faith in God to having faith in faith. So they think that if I have enough faith, as they're told, that if I have enough faith that I can be healed. And it's all up to me. So I start believing in my faith. All right? Or if I have enough faith, then I can get rich. Um, it's not faith in God, but it's faith in my faith. And when it doesn't happen, then it's their faith that's weak. So they didn't have enough faith in faith. You see where I'm going here? And it's just a cheap knockoff of trusting and depending on God. Now, faith always has an object. And faith in the Bible, the object of faith is Jesus, is trust in Jesus and, and faith in Jesus, not faith in faith or faith in people or faith in myself. Jesus always is the sole object of faith. It's not faith in a set of beliefs. It's not faith in a church. It's not, it's not faith in a pastor or a denomination or even the Bible. Faith has as an object, and always the object of faith is given to us in the Bible, is the person of Jesus Christ. He told his disciples on the night when he was betrayed up there in the upper room at the beginning of John 14, remember he said, don't be afraid. What are you troubled about? What are you worried about, guys? 
He said, believe in me. He didn't say, believe in the system that I'm putting in place. Believe in the philosophy that I'm making. Believe, you know, in this, these other things. He said, believe in me. It's always the person of Jesus Christ. And it's not about how, how great our faith is. It's about who our faith is in. Our faith could be small, mustard seed small, but our God is big. Now, we, we don't need to have impressive faith. God is impressive. We have faith in him. My faith may fail, but the one in whom I have faith never fails. You see, it's not about our faith. It's about the object of our faith, Jesus. The woman pushed through the crowd, not because she had great faith, but because she had just a little bit of faith in Jesus. And Jesus always can be trusted. You may have just a little bit of faith in Jesus today. I don't know. You may be just starting out. We're all starting out, it seems, over and over in life, aren't we? Like I say all the time, we're freshmen many times. We're always starting over. But faith and trust and dependence on God is what makes it possible for us to receive from Jesus what he wants to give us is when we have faith in him because Jesus is able. The apostle Paul was a man who had great faith as we know and he, he was in fact probably the most courageous man ever to live. You read his whole life story and it's just absolutely unbelievable. And, and you know, we, we see no report of him ever being afraid, but even in the face of death. As a matter of fact, God had told him that he wanted him to go to Rome. And Paul knew that going to Rome would mean his death because they were killing Jews there and they were killing Christians there. But Paul went to the place, to Jerusalem, so he could be arrested and so he could be transported to Rome. And there, while he was in Rome, uh, in jail for two and a half years, all because he wanted to, because he wanted to obey God, because it was, a, it was, a, it was something good for the kingdom. Two and a half years he's there, and he wrote a few letters to some people like the Ephesians and the Philippians and you know Philemon and Colossians and just a few little letters that what, where would we be without those you know those words to the Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians but he also wrote some letters to a young man named Timothy uh, while he was in prison and he was kind of like last words because he knows that that death is getting close. I just wanted to read this passage from him to talk about this faith. 2 Timothy 1, 12. Paul says, For this reason I also suffer these things. He's in jail. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Boy, do you see the faith in that? I know him. And I've entrusted to him to that day. I know who I have believed. There's his faith. And he's just convinced that Jesus is able. That's all he needed, to know that Jesus is able. I may be disabled, but Jesus is able. I may be incapable, but he is always capable. And Paul says, I know him. He's able. He was able 20 years ago in my life, in, in my ministry. He's, he's able today. He's been faithful all these years. He's never let me down. And everything which I have committed to him, he has always been capable and faithful to me that I've entrusted to him. You see, what you, what you give to Jesus, he keeps. I mean, what you don't give to him, uh, he can't keep. Well, what you give to God, he takes. And what God takes, he he cleanses, and what, what God cleanses, he, he fills, and what God fills, he uses. And you never worry about it again, because it's his. You've entrusted it to him. But what you withhold from him becomes your point of worry and anxiety. So if we say, I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to give my life to him except for, you know, my finances. Uh, he doesn't really know much about money, and I know a whole lot more about money. Excuse me, but your point of problem is going to be right there in your finances. That's where your fear is going to be. 
if you if you decide you know I, I believe in him and I'm going to give him one day a week but the other six days are mine you're gonna have six days of worry and fear and probably one day when you're at peace if you say I believe in him and I'm going to uh, give him my life except you know my relationships what does God know about that stuff about what goes on between a man and a woman and in my relationships so that's that's over here you know where you're gonna have your problems where you're gonna have your fear is with what you with withheld from him God can't be trusted where there is no faith and there's gonna be fear and what we choose to withhold is where there's going to be some problems and anxiety and fear the woman with the hemorrhage such small simple faith uh, she was her last jesus was her last hope and her faith was so small but jesus is where she put her faith and she had one hope all of her money's gone she's an outcast except for jesus she's nameless no no cathedrals named after her, which means that she's just like one of us. She's no great leader in the church. She's just a common person. And we all begin like her. Uh, no one comes to Jesus knowing who he is or entrusting all that we have to him. None of us come to him and make a total commitment because we don't know enough to make a total commitment. We all come with just a little bit of faith will he meet this need that i have we come with some fear and we come with some trembling afraid that maybe we've kind of tugged on the coat of the god of the universe and we're not sure what we've awakened there and we're not really sure that we can do that you all remember your first real prayer remember your first real prayer to god wow terrifying thing we're not sure how he's going to respond but but when our little faith is in him it's enough because he's able we find that our little faith placed in the right person is enough you remember that moment boy I was thinking about this week how many times I've prayed to God Lord would you restore to me the joy of my salvation that moment when I first found you that, that moment when I touched the hem on your garment and you received me I didn't know who you were. <laughs> I didn't know any, any theology. I didn't know any scripture. I didn't know anything about you. Wow. I'm just shocked. Just so surprised. Remember that moment? I hope you do. Maybe you were six or 16 or, or 66. I don't, I don't know. But do, do you remember that moment when you first believed? It had nothing to do with my self-esteem. It had nothing to do with the goodness of humanity. It had nothing to do with the church or our luck or fate or anything. You know, each one of us as we come the first time, it's just about Jesus. We have a, a simple need and he might be the answer. That's where we start. That's just that little bit of mustard seed faith. Hopefully we grow in that, but, but sometimes we have to go all the way back to just that little bit of faith that we had that day where we just dared believe, you know. Faith is how it happens, just trust and dependence on Him. What was, what was your need then? Do you remember? Can, can you think back? What, what's your need? what was your need that first time that you prayed? What was your need that first day? Did He meet it? Of course He did. He's always able, always willing to meet it. And what's your need today? What is it that you would touch the cloak of his garment and say, Lord, if you don't do something here, I'm lost. There's, there's nothing. Lord, if you don't do something, we've all got, as, as we travel with him, we've all got that one thing. What is it today? If you're here as, as we go into a time of prayer, if you're here today and you, you're thinking about that, Lord, if you could just do this, would you reach out in faith today?
As deep cries out 